Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Digital Health and Wearables series. Today I have another magnificent guest for you, but if you have not subscribed, please do so and share this magnificent content with your communities in healthcare. And also let me acknowledge our partners, our series partner VMware and our global partner Spirit Digital. But I'm extremely excited and delighted to have another magnificent guest for you. Today we have Dr. Amir Kala Lali, which is a physician, a board director, an investor, and also a curator of communities. Dr. Ramir, how are you? Great, thanks. How are you doing in Brighton, I think, right? Yes, I'm based in UK. That's great. I, you know, I do know Brighton quite well. I did my cardiology training in Brighton, so I have happy memories of being young and a uh, new doctor doing that. Oh, fantastic. We have this connection. I've been in Brighton for 20 years. That's great. Brilliant. So, I, did, I did. Brighton has lovely weather for England, but that's the reason. The weather is one of the reasons I moved from uh, London to Southern California. So that's where <laughs> I was funny. Yeah. Today is really nice. There's a lot of uh, bright sunshine. But um, what I would like to discuss today, a broader discussion, but around decentralized trials, clinical trials, and also the patient empowerment bit. Would that be okay? Of course. Yeah. Brilliant. So the first question that I have for you is. Tell me more about your journey from London and UK to the United States and how the CNS Summit came about. Oh, sure. So uh, briefly, I mean, I trained in medicine in, in London, finished doing all that, and I decided to move to the UK. Sorry about that. My camera decided to jump for a minute. Uh, so I moved from London to uh, Southern California to in academia. So I moved over to the US to really be an academic and did that for a few years. And then after that, um, I was asked to join industry. So for over 20 years, I was running uh, clinical trials for the largest clinical trials company, it still is, uh, around the world and spent that time really at the, what I would call the bleeding edge of clinical trials. So having to really develop clinical trials globally uh, in many places that some people never heard the names of. So that was kind of a fun thing to do and really try and bring those new treatments options to patients, not just in the US, but all over the world. Um, so I did that for about 20 years. And then while I was doing that, I started as a hobby to really bring together leaders. So it actually started with my first nonprofit, the International Society for CNS Drug Development. And that, that came out of my understanding that one time I was running all eight phase three programs in a particular indication and none of the people running those in the pharmaceutical companies were talking to each other. So it's hard to believe, but you know, 20 years ago, my joke was if two industry people were talking at, a, at an academic meeting, one was interviewing for a job. They really didn't talk about their programs. It was very secretive. And I really didn't think that would be, that's a good thing for patients. I thought there's a lot we can learn. We can compete on the compounds, but we need to be really thinking about the tools and the methodology. So started kind of groups coming together to really try and help each other to try and optimize the chance of success for everyone. And then Summit really came about when I realized that, you know, we had the leaders there in a, in a small group, but really to change the culture of the whole ecosystem, you needed everyone there. So that summit is a bigger meeting where we have every part of the ecosystem coming together and really collaborating for novel solutions, as we call it. So there's just this culture of understanding that patients would want us to collaborate and that we should be doing better in everything that we do. The second thing that was kind of important at summit was the role of technology. So again, going back 12 years ago when we started summit, uh, in general, pharma people didn't think too much about technology. You know, it was all about drug development and molecules. You know, Google wasn't around, you know, the iPhone wasn't around. It really wasn't in our everyday lives. So it actually took quite a while to persuade people that this technology thing might be big, that we need to think about it. So the first few years, it was really quite interesting trying to persuade people that they should think about it. I remember going to technology meetings and people in life sciences asking me, 
why are you in technology meetings? Why, why is that relevant to us? You know, and I, you know, tried to explain that I felt that, you know, that was going to have a huge impact on us going forward. And now, obviously, 12 years later, even, you know, meetings that are very much bio only have had to, you know, have sessions on AI and other things and frankly, teach, you know, old academics new tricks around understanding new methods that can dramatically change how we do things. Oh, so that's the background. Oh, fantastic. So you've been there from, let's say, the inception of the emerging clinical trials with a blend of technology. Fantastic. Yes. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Moving on to the second question yeah. is you are also the founder of the Decentralized Trials Research Alliance. And yes. Why is that important for patients? Sure. So the DTRA, which is at DTRA.org, we actually were thinking about this prior to the pandemic. So an obvious guess might be that we started this because of the pandemic. Uh, in fact, we were thinking about doing decentralized research and really enhancing that prior to the pandemic. The challenge was before that, there was a lot of pilots, but people were very slow to move in terms of moving to decentralized models. When the pandemic happened, it, there was no choice, right? It was forced innovation. So to keep trials going, the only way to keep them going in most cases was to have some components of decentralization. So that's why it really became sort of mission critical for companies to be able to understand and implement decentralized trials. And so although we'd already been working on starting this alliance, it certainly accelerated it. So uh, once we launched it, very quickly, we had 130 organizations from uh, regulators, uh, pharmaceutical companies, service companies, patient advocacy groups, and others who have joined. And that the mission of that is not so much, you know, a lot of people think about, well, uh, is decentralized trials going to replace, you know, brick and mortar sites? The answer is no. Uh, what we would like to do is really use decentralized methodologies for aspects of a trial. So no trial necessarily is going to be 100% this or that. The question really is what aspect can you make decentralized to give more optionality to patients? So the reason it's important to patients is many patients could not really access clinical trials because the sites available were just too far from them. So can we enable patients in areas that have never been communities, that have never been underserved communities, geographically distant communities, how can we help them access the clinical trials that have been available to people living near academic centers in big cities? So that's one component of it. And there's many other aspects of decentralized that will help patients. And so we're working on that. I think what DTRA is doing is we have four priority areas, which is on the website, 12 initiatives, and many of them include First of all, educating people about what is decentralized, what we mean by that, what are the advantages of decentralized. There's a lot of assumptions around that. For instance, people believe that decentralized trials will improve diversity. Um, we need to generate that evidence. So part of it is our members of the companies doing the work. So we're going to leverage that and generate the evidence so we could, in an evidence way manner, really understand where is it appropriate, where should be used and go forward by reducing barriers. So to give you an example, I used to, for a living, run global trials that would run in 60, 70 countries, right? And you could do that in a traditional trial. Right now with a decentralized trial, the, even the regulatory authorities do not have harmonized guidances around what's acceptable. So we're working on that with the regulators to be able to run a decentralized trial globally as well in the way we do traditionally. So there's much work to be done, but that's where I think we're trying to do our best to allow patients to fully participate in clinical research. Oh, fantastic. I mean, really fantastic mission to bring all the stakeholders together and advance and speed up the process. But we're talking about, um, maybe I go to the third and last question, but we're talking about before the recording about wearables. You know, I'm also a fan of wearables and, yes. and I believe the wearables have a really a strategic role in here and gathering the data, bringing the data in and also allow people to do a lot of self-management in different things with it. And I know you also are, are, are passionate about wearables. Do you want to do you want to say anything around that? Sure. If, if I was to have turned the camera around, there's a, this my home office is like a museum of tech. <laughs> you know from the google glass that everyone had for a little while to others you know at the moment well let's see i've got the typical apple watch i have many other watches but the apple watch seems to have won over with all this technology right 
on this hand, I have the uh, Amazon Halo, which is similar to the hoop, uh, the Aura Ring, obviously. Um, I, I do have some others, but I've run out of limbs. So <laughs> I know, for instance, the Facebook Watch is coming. Uh, others are coming. But for me, at the moment, I find uh, the Apple and the Amazon the most useful uh, in terms of form factor. In terms of wearables, you know, they're not in my world as opposed to the consumer world. I think many manufacturers of wearables are trying to move into clinical research and there's a lot of work to be done to really validate whether, you know, those particular wearables are robust enough for the purposes of regulatory authorities. So part of our work is to really understand and help people. And there's many people working on this. Uh, how do you make sure that you choose the right wearable and you put it in the right context? And again, it's not just wearables, right? There is, there's invisibles. There's actually stuff that you can put in your house and it, it, that can actually know whether how much you're moving, how you're moving, all that stuff. There's a lot of developments beyond, you know, wearables in, you know, things you can eat, things you can don't have to wear, but certainly wearables make a big part of being able to assess patients in their home for sure. And as they're walking around, you know, their community. Sure. Brilliant. The third and the last question is, What's next for decentralized clinical trials? And what is on the horizon for life sciences? Sure. Um, you know, for decentralized uh, trials, I would say research, I would say the sustainability is the question. So whether, you know, you think about healthcare, is telemedicine going to uh, continue being highly utilized? We know the rates have dropped since the pandemic has kind of slowed down. Um, same thing with decentralized. The question is, what is the sustainability of these methodologies? Are they going to be continue to be used or are companies going to go back to the old way? So that's the big question, right? And we will talk about that both at Siena Summit that's coming up and DTRA annual meeting as well, both in November. In terms of life sciences in general, I guess at the moment, there's just so much activity. So life sciences have always been, you know, really well funded. But I think more than ever, the pandemic certainly emphasized that to general kind of VCs and other funders of uh, research. So there is every day more funding coming to life sciences. So the question really is, how do we best utilize that? And how do we use collaboration as a way of making sure these networks really leverage the investments coming in to really develop the treatments that we need and how to develop treatments that you know, people really need that may not be commercially viable? How do we do that and how do we best use all the investments that are coming into our world right now. Oh, fantastic. I mean, we could talk for hours. We come to the end of the show. I finish all my episodes with a, with a very quick question. It's not really a question as such. It's called one minute of fame. And you can men mention anything. I mean, the, the researcher alliance, your work, a shout out to a company, your personal life, family, anything whatsoever, your trips, because you travel a lot, you move around and anything whatsoever. So to round up one minute of time, over to you. Sure, I mean, I certainly encourage everyone as they wanting to travel again to continue to do so. I think the death of travel is exaggerated. Uh, um, I think we can all try and be sensible in our travel in terms of our carbon footprints, but I certainly have quite a few tri trips planned already. Um, so I would encourage everyone to go and meet new cultures and see new people. I think that's an important part of all our development. Um, I certainly won't be quite doing the 40 countries a year I used to do. Uh, but uh, secondly, I think the things we mentioned, I think if people are interested in the intersection of technology and life sciences, uh, cnsummit.org is a good one to go and look up, uh, dtra.org is a good one to look up. And I would just say, you know, just continue to be open-minded about who you meet and what you look at, because you never know where the connections are that will help you in your daily work. Fantastic. I mean, thank you so much for your time, for your expertise and this magnificent piece of information and all the content and for your availability, of course. Sure. My pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to round up now. So thanks to our viewers and listeners. Make sure you subscribe, connect with Dr. Amir. I'm going to put this LinkedIn and Twitter in here and uh, I'll see you all next time.